Six Israeli hostages were murdered this week by Hamas as soldiers closed in on the underground location where they were being held. A spokesman for the Kamala Harris team, Hami Tarista, was quick to condemn the act and reaffirm the vice president's support of Israel. He said, and I quote, Kamala is committed to working with Hamas to get the remaining 97 hostages out of Gaza quickly before their Jewishness, you know, really rubs off on the place. End quote. The president, Vacation Joe, between trips to the beach and licks of his ice cream cone, managed to blame all the death on Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Biden was convinced that Netanyahu, a man who has written multiple books on fighting terrorism, was doing the whole hostage rescue thing wrong and that Biden alone could solve the problem. If only someone would kindly explain to him what the problem was because the conversation ran a little long and he forgot the question. Let's get into it. I'm Tyler Cressman. Welcome to the Cressman Conversation. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cressman Conversation. Today on the podcast, we are going to discuss the six Israeli hostages who were killed a Chinese spy in the New York governor's office, and we're going to touch very briefly on the Arlington Trump controversy. But first, as always, my favorite comment from last week, we had a man, Douglas Guthrie, possibly, Guthrie, said, quote, absolutely savage, I effing love it, end quote. Thank you, Douglas. We pull no punches here on the Crestman conversation. We like to have fun. We like to... Well, we really like to make fun of Kamala Harris. It's really one of our favorite things here to do, especially my favorite thing. Right in the intros is always a lot of fun whenever I get to mock someone. It's, it's great. As always, I don't know how many times I can say this. I think it's funny. When you put yourself in the public eye, when you're running for president, the, the gloves are off. I think there is a, there is a certain level of decorum that politicians, when they deal with each other, should have, maybe, possibly. But you're putting yourself in the arena. I think it's wrong to be rude to people on the internet, especially like regular people. I don't know why people want to argue with them. I will make fun of Kamala Harris or AOC or Joe Biden all day long. They have put themselves in this position. They control power over my life. That means that they are now the subject of mockery. But be nice to people on the internet. People, I don't understand it. It's, it's not that hard. Again, I don't think you have to be nice to Donald Trump. If you don't like Donald Trump, you could be mean to Donald Trump. He put himself in the arena. He is a man in the arena. But to hate on people just because your fellow citizens, Donald Trump, if he was elected president, he would have some power over your life. This is true. That means he is the subject, and it is an appropriate subject for mockery. You don't get to want to be the king. And this, and I'm talking to Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, whoever. You don't get to exercise power over other people and then also say that you are above mockery. No, no, no. Again, regular people, it's a different standard. People in the public eye, people who want to exercise power over you, mock them relentlessly. I have no issues with this whatsoever. That is my standard. I feel like people don't understand it, but that's my standard. Anyway, Douglas, we will mock Kamala Harris until she loses the election in November and then hopefully fades off into obscurity where she belongs, where all of the no-talent, low-intellect people wander off. Like that in... The first Inside Out movie, when the imaginary friend disappears off into the void of forgotten memories or whatever. That's what we hope happens to Kamala Harris, where I never have to hear her name again. Like Cori Bush before her. We're bringing her back, but hopefully we never have to talk about her again. It's great. All right. On to our first subject, which we have to get a little more somber about, because it is, it is a sad subject to have to talk about. Six people, including one... Excuse me, including one person who was a dual Israel, Israel and American citizen, six hostages were murdered by Hamas over this past week. This is a this is a hard subject to talk about because it it the brutality, the evilness of the act is just hard to quantify for people who live in the United States. The United States has issues. We have issues with crime. It exists. There are people who are murdered or shot or stabbed, assaulted, sexually assaulted. Bad things happen in the United States. And we have particular people in the United States who are evil. It's a country of 350 million people. There are evil people on the streets who want to do evil things and commit terrible acts. But it is impossible to understand what a culture of 
evil looks like. Hamas or Al-Qaeda, these people, they are cultures that celebrate evil. And the way that you get there, or, or like the Nazis before them, the way that you get there is by convincing yourself that the evil acts you're doing are not actually bad, but they're moral, they're good. Hamas views the Jews as someone who needs to be exterminated because they believe that the Jewish people are evil. They believe that they are manifestations of Satan incarnate and that they, to kill Jews, is actually a moral good for the world because Jews are a negative. This is a perverse and insane way to live, but they actually believe that. And when people actually believe something, we should listen to them. Hamas, is do, they are doing evil, terrible, god-awful things. They, are, they will kill babies and children and rape women to death. They are the scum of the earth. And these six people who were killed this week, they were killed because they were going to be rescued. They have been held as human shields in conditions of what we can only imagine is abject misery since October of last year. One of the hostages, they, I, <clears throat> which one was it? One of the hostages they recovered was 79 pounds when they recovered her. She had lost, I think they said that she was 120 pounds when she was taken, uh, roughly, the, they estimated. So do that math, 40 pounds. They were starving her to death over the course of the last year. And this was a beautiful young woman who was 25 who had her entire life ahead of her and she was she was abducted we can only imagine the horrible things that were done to her and she was starved to death and then right before right before she was to get rescued somewhere they estimated after the autopsy 48 hours prior to the recovery of their bodies she was shot multiple times point blank executed in a tunnel underground after 10 months in captivity these are evil terrible horrible people and this ceasefire talk that you're you're seeing so these things happen the president or what we'll call the pretend president right now vacation joe he from his beach in delaware said well it i hope this brings people to the table so we can talk a ceasefire i hope we can do this who are we negotiating with this is a question it is such an easy question tell me who we're negotiating with are we negotiating with Hamas, we're negotiating with the kind of people who will starve people in a tunnel to death and then execute them. We're talking about people who will brag. They're not hiding the evil that they do. They brag about it. They brag about how much they want to kill Jews. They brag about the sexual violence they committed against the Jewish dogs. These are terrible people. We're going to bring them to the table. Are the kind of people who will execute six hostages to avoid them being recovered or freed, the kind of people who will execute six hostages are the kind of people that we're supposed to negotiate a ceasefire with? No, go to hell. The moral calculus on the left, people like Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, in the same breath that they condemn this act, Hamas is so bad, Hamas is so evil, how can they do this? This act was terrible. Now, if only, no, if only Benjamin Netanyahu would come to the negotiating table for a ceasefire, this whole thing could have been avoided outrageous such a stupid take from such a stupid person that is it is not the ceasefire is not the problem here oh you mean hamas doesn't want israel to deploy troops in the philadelphia corridor because it's important and israel says no we're going to keep our troops there so you can't attack us again oh but it led to sick the death of six hostages 1200 people were already murdered in israel 10 months ago. We forgot that. Could you imagine? I've said it multiple times. If one single rocket was fired from Juarez and hit the United States, Mexico would be the 51st through the 55th state. We probably divide it up. It's a big country. But it would be America. It would be our country. We would just take it over. That would, that's what would happen. We're supposed, 1,200 people were murdered in Israel. 10 months ago, in October, and we're supposed to, or I guess 11 months ago, now it's September, we're supposed to just pretend, well, if only Israel would be more reasonable. Oh, if only they would just 
come to the negotiating table for a ceasefire. We could all just go back to being friends. You mean like October 6th, before Hamas started a war, before they invaded a country and murdered and raped innocent people who, you're talking young people at a music festival, people who lived in these kibbutzes on the border, these peacenik hippies with no weapons who were just, you know, for fun, murdered. One of the hostages, he lost his arm on October 7th last year. He was blown up by a grenade. They took him to a hospital and sawed off his arm. No anesthetic. They sawed it off and, tur- and healed it up in this tunnel so they could keep him as a hostage. They cut off a young man's arm and then kept him in a tunnel for 11 months and then shot him in the back of the head. before he. W- instead of him being rescued, instead of him being traded for, instead of anything, they said, all right, well, we don't want these Jews to go free. We'll kill him. He's, he served his purpose. Evil evil people. 97. The 251 people were abducted in Israel. 97 of them still remain. They think probably 30-something of them are dead. They're just bodies. So you have potentially 60 people who are still alive in tunnels 11 months later. It's outrageous that you're trying to paint Israel as the bad guy. Well, Benjamin Netanyahu won't negotiate. Who should he negotiate with? Who is going to sit across the table with him? The people who are holding hostages? Do you negotiate with terrorists? Have we learned nothing? You don't negotiate with terrorists. You kill terrorists. That's what you do. You don't say, will you please give me my hostage back? We'll give you some of the land, pretty please. No, you say, you give the hostage back, or we're going to come in there and we're going to kill you and every single person who had anything to do with taking these hostages. Any single one of them. You're dead. We're going to blow up your house. We're going to blow up your cars. You're ne- we'll sit there and we will surround your tunnels and we will starve you out because... I, I'm trying not to use bad words because you can go to hell. You don't negotiate with terrorists. You don't give them what you want. You crush them with an iron fist. That's how you deal with terrorism. This book I held up in the intro, Fighting Terrorism. Benjamin Netanyahu wrote this book. I wonder when the, I should have looked it up. I wonder when it is. I read this before. You don't give them what they want. Do you think appeasement works? Do we forget the lesson? Remember when... They talk about it all the time. The, who was it? Um, Neville. Neville Chamberlain gave Hitler what he wants. Oh, we'll just give him a little bit. He just wants Poland. He just wants Austria. I know on Tucker Carlson this week, there was some moron trying to talk about Winston Churchill escalated the Second World War in a, in, in a historical reading of that war. But no, it, Hitler was the bad guy. And you don't beat Hitler by giving him what he wants. You don't beat Hamas by giving him what they want. How about, how's that working out in Afghanistan? Remember when we negotiated, we were going to pull out, and the Taliban said, we promise we're not going to take back Afghanistan. We'll just stay to our little area in the north, and it'll be fine. How did that work out? The first day, they were walking into cities and taking them over because they don't respect peace. They don't want peace. They want conquest. They want to be in control. They want to fight because they believe they are doing good. Hamas believes they're doing the Lord's work. They are riding for Allah. And that's what they believe. And if you don't understand that, I don't know what to tell you. Get out of foreign policy. You do not negotiate with terrorists. It's not, there is no part of this. It, okay, I'm, I'm, before I say that, October 7th was a massive intelligence failure that Netanyahu has to own. He does. I like Benjamin Netanyahu. I've read a couple of his books. He has to own that. That's on him. <clears throat> the rest of it, any hostage that they took that is murdered, now, today, that's not his fault because he has waged a campaign and he has destroyed Hamas. He has destroyed them. And you might not like that, but you can't say he hasn't done it. He's done a great job of it. He is not the bad guy. This is not his fault. He has no one to negotiate with. And, and we can't pretend that the election in November doesn't matter for the international stability of the world. It does. Harris will be the worst president Israel has ever had to rely on. And I know there are people out there who don't care about Israel. They don't understand why we should give them money. They don't get it. Or worse, they think that Israel is the bad guy. Well, I'm not going to talk to those people because those people are wrong. They don't know anything. They don't understand the conflict. They don't know the history. They don't get it. But the people who think, well, why do we have to support Israel the way we do? Because it is our, our, it's not our duty 
Take out anything out of it. Take the morality out of it. Be, be pragmatic about this situation. We have a democracy in the Middle East that is our ally, one of our staunchest supporters in the world, and they fight terrorists on a daily basis, and they do it really well. <clears throat> terrorism, if we have learned nothing since the year 2001, terrorism is now the major export from the Middle East. You have opium, you have oil, and you have terrorism. This is what they're known for. It does not stay in the Middle East. Do you think, for example, if Israel was wiped out today, in Iran, got to have their run, Hamas takes it over, Palestine extends from the river to the sea, and Israel is wiped off the face of the earth, is the world safer or less safe for Americans? Do you think it has no bearing whatsoever on America? You're out of your mind. A Palestinian was arrested this past week with money in his pocket from Iran in a foiled attempt to kill Donald Trump. They arrested him this week. And we don't talk about this stuff because it, he was arrested. So it doesn't matter because it was just some crazy guy who was going to try and kill the president, but we got him. That's great. I'm glad it worked. I'm glad we got him. That's the plan. The plan is Iran is going to kill Americans because they do not like us. They think we are bad. They think we are evil, and that is what they do. They want to foment distress in the rest of the world so they can grow their sphere of influence. The Hamas in, in Palestine, the Houthis in Lebanon, all of these people, they are under the control of Iran, which is why Barack Obama and Joe Biden are completely backwards on foreign policy. This idea we're going to give Iran anything, Donald Trump effectively strangled Iran he took all of the money that they had and he reduced their economy by 50% in one year. And it was, it's outrageous that people thought he was doing a bad job. He was controlling the number one terror proxy in the world, which is Iran, who funds terrorism across the world. Donald Trump, who you could say, he doesn't know anything about the Middle East. I don't care. I don't care if that's true or not because his instincts are right. The sanctions the most stringent sanctions you could possibly imagine. He placed on Iran and prevented them from doing any business, and he strangled their economy. We would probably have a new regime in Iran with no intervention from United States troops because they had no money, and the people were finally understanding that if the regime has no money, there was going to be a new government. It was just going to happen. And Obama, he, he started the idea of strengthening Iran it's not working out so great. Donald Trump strangled Iran. And then Joe Biden has gone straight back to strengthening Iran. And what has happened? The world is less safe. And people don't seem to understand this. Donald Trump did an effective job on the Middle East. More effective than any president in my lifetime. And people do not understand this whatsoever. And it's annoying because Kamala Harris will be worse. She doesn't understand the Middle East. She is of the backwards antiquated lens that peace has to be established through Palestine. This is nonsense. This is silly. It doesn't work that way. Donald Trump went around Palestine. He said, they're bad actors. We're not going to negotiate with them because they do not play in good faith. And he went outside of that, and he negotiated normalized relations with Israel in two major Arab countries, which has not happened in 30 years. And it cut the Palestinians out of it. You're not going to negotiate with people who elect Hamas or the Palestinian Authority. Ask Yasser Arafat and Bill Clinton whether or not you can negotiate in good faith with terrorists. The answer is no. No, you cannot. And Donald Trump understands this, and Kamala Harris doesn't. She says Israel needs to come to the table for a ceasefire. She is the one who wants to slow walk aid to Israel and while they're fighting an existential war for their survival. It's nonsense. She'd be terrible. Donald Trump is the better choice. Without a doubt. Getting all worked up over here, obviously. <clears throat> okay. I want to move on, though, because we're, we're at the 18-minute mark. I want to move on to our second topic. I want to talk about China. The other, the, the axis of evil, the real axis of evil, Iran, China, and Russia. North Korea likes to pretend. No one gives a shit about North Korea. And let's be honest. No one cares. But Iran is powerful. China is powerful. Russia is is powerful. They all have their own little spheres of influence that they work in. China, though, is very good at this thing that they do in the past 10 years where they infiltrate spies into government agencies. 
Now, I can name a lot of Democrats that this has happened to, but it's, it doesn't just go one way. It does go both ways. They go on the Democratic side. They go on the Republican side. They just target people. But they do it in a very intelligent way. So, for example, they will get a mayor of a town. This is how deep their tentacles reach in American politics. They will have somebody who will compromise the mayor of a medium-sized town in some state who they just suspect could one day be a player. So this happened in California. I'm, I'm just remembering this, so I, I don't have it written down. But I remember the, the thing was they got dirt on a mayor who was in some medium-sized town in California, and then he ran for the state, a state seat there, I believe, and then it came out that they had this dirt on him, and he was compromised, and they arrested the spy, so it, it's great. They arrested the spy, that's nice. But the point is that they are not just out here trying to compromise the president, trying to compromise senators, trying to compromise people in the House. They are in everything. They're in local politics because they get in early, and then they own you for your entire career. So this week, a Chinese spy was arrested in New York who worked for the New York governor's office. Her name was, or is, Linda Sun. Her and her husband were both arrested. They were charged with multiple crimes, including failing to register as a foreign agent, visa fraud, money laundering, a couple things. Again, it's happening all over the country. We remember Fang Fang, who was the Chinese spy that Eric Swalwell was sleeping with. There was also a, I believe, what's his name? Bob Menendez was arrested for, it, his was from Egypt, though. He was receiving gifts from foreign agents from Egypt. But it's happening. This is, this is standard diplomatic stuff. This is espionage, the way that it's always been run. I, have, I am sure that American agents around the globe are working to compromise people in other countries. This is the way countries behave. So I'm not going to say, oh, my God, China's doing this thing that's never been done before, blah, blah, blah. They're doing it well is the problem. They're doing it really well, and we should be worried. Linda Sun, she worked for 14 years in politics in New York. 14 years she's been doing this. And she eventually worked her way up, and she was the deputy chief of staff to the governor of New York, Kathy Hochul. Kathy Hochul. She, 14 years she's been doing this. Think about that for a second. Think about how deeply embedded she is with these people. And yet she still was working for China, despite the fact that she rose through the ranks for over a decade and was the deputy chief of staff to the governor of New York. New York is a major state. It is a giant state. And the governor it has a very important role. We remember she worked for Andrew Como in some capacity. She was promoted under Kathy Hochul and became the deputy chief of staff. She used this office to help the Chinese Communist Party, including allegedly blocking Taiwanese diplomats from contacting the government. She shared documents with Beijing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw the word allegedly in here because she hasn't been convicted. Allegedly, she shared documents with Beijing, she added a Chinese official to a private government phone call about COVID. So they were on some big conference call, and she apparently attached Chinese officials to them. She bragged about getting the governor's speechwriter to not mention the Uyghur situation. I'll mention it right now. The Uyghurs are a group of Muslims in China. There's about a million of them who are currently in a concentration camp or multiple concentration camps across China for re-education because being a Muslim is illegal in China. So they are getting re-educated as we speak today. Meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party was providing her all sorts of lavish gifts from tickets to expensive shows. She got a Ferrari, a Range Rover. She had million-dollar homes in Hawaii and New York. The funniest one, the funniest perk that's listed, I saw this listed multiple times, was there some sort of, I can't remember, Nanking something duck, some sort of delicacy, some sort of Chinese delicacy where they've cooked this duck. I don't know. But she, they said she had, she had the duck, the duck delicacy made by private chefs and delivered to her home of her and her parents over 16 times. So I thought that's next to the Ferrari and the Range Rover and the million dollar homes in Hawaii. They're like, and don't, I know you're sitting, sit down for this one. She got duck delivered. Again, I'm not saying it's nothing, but I did think it was funny that that was thrown into all of the reports of how much she got this 
specialty duck delivered over 16 times to the family house. It's just outrageous. I, was, I wasn't upset until I read that last little bit, and then I was furious. This is a serious, a very serious problem that we need to figure out how to address. I don't know the solution, by the way. I, it's hard because there is a, a tinge. There is a tinge of xenophobia that will accompany any sort of diving into this topic. I have a couple things that I think are ideas, but it's, it's very difficult. And one of them is something like, this has nothing to do with politics, but what we're seeing is a lot of foreign governments will pay for their students to come to the United States, for example. China, we'll use China as an example. China p- spends a lot of money to send students to the United States for education, at which point they, when they graduate, they immediately go back to China and work. It's part of their thing. If China continues to have spies, we should exert pressure on them in different ways. For example, saying we will no longer approve student visas from China. China has decided that they are going to be a bad actor. They are sending spies here. A lot of our spies actually start off as students, which is true. The Chinese government will send someone on a student visa to the United States, at which point that person graduates or stays in the U.S., and then they exert their influence, or they, they make friends with people who will eventually go on to be in politics, and they know them for a young age, so you trust them. But they work for the Chinese government. Suspending student visas from China... It's an idea. Why do we not talk about it? China is sending spies, posing as students. No more students from China. We don't need to approve their visas. We have plenty of students in the United States, plenty of students all over the world who want to come to the United States and study. I think it's a great thing that we accept foreign students in to study in the United States. We have the best schools in the world. But why the best higher education, I should say, not necessarily our high schools and grade schools, but our higher education, we have the best, the Ivy League is still the greatest institutions in the world for credentialing, at least. I won't say they're the greatest for education, but they are still highly respected. You have some in Britain, obviously, Oxford, but I think that it's still a, there's still a lot of credentialing that people wish to have from the United States. And despite the fact that Harvard is terrible, there are a lot of things you could learn there. So anyway, my point is, We don't need to accept students from China. There's a lot of other students who want to come here for an education. Suspend them. You have to punish this. It's not just enough that we arrested Linda Sun and her husband. China is trying to compromise our political system. And that, even though we all do it, even though every country in the world engages in it, when you catch them, you have to punish them. You have to. So, first of all, I think it's ridiculous these people were let out on bail. I think that New York has stupid laws around bail, make no sense. You're talking these people received millions of dollars worth of gifts, and their bail was set at a million dollars, which means they had to put up, I think, $100,000 of a bond. It's ridiculous. You're a spy. You're obviously a flight risk. You should be reprimanded to jail. You have people who were arrested for January 6th nonsense who were sat in jail for eight, ten months, years now. And you're telling me that the Chinese spy who's working for the, a government that we are not friends with, gets released out on bail? No, you stay in jail. You don't get to go home. And I understand that maybe she's innocent. Maybe this is all just a bunch of nonsense, a big misunderstanding. I get that. You're innocent until proven guilty. It's a great thing. But you're a spy. And, and if you're a spy, the government should hold on to you so you can't take all your spying nonsense and flee the country. That seems to be an important one. I don't think the government arrests people for being spies overly often and are wrong about it. I feel like that's one that's hard to mess up, but who knows? I could be totally wrong. Anyone who is caught in a compromised situation, anyone who is working for a foreign government without registering any of this stuff, any of this nonsense, that seems like treason to me. And if you are committing treason, prison. Send them all to prison. It's easy. Easy to do. You're working for a foreign government. You're not registered that you're doing it. Go to jail, directly to jail. You do not pass go. You do not collect $100. You 
go to prison. I so I send this person to prison for a long time, long, long time. And anyone who was knowingly working with her or was compromised and didn't report her or had knowledge of her working, any of this, send them all to jail, everybody. That's my solution to so many things. Send the people who break the law to jail. It seems like a simple solution, yet people seem to struggle with it. I don't know why. Okay, anyway, let's uh, move on to the third thing. We're only going to touch on this briefly because I don't really care about it. I think it's stupid. I want to clarify some things. I just, I, we got to talk about it because it was big in the news today. It was a, such a huge risk. Donald Trump was invited. This is important. He was invited by the members of the Gold Star family of the people who were killed at Abbey Gate in Afghanistan three years ago. For those people who don't remember, Joe Biden's disastrous, debacle, terrible pullout from Afghanistan caused the death of 13 service members of the United States military and their families invited Donald Trump on the anniversary of the pullout of their, of their deaths to Arlington National Cemetery. Now, Arlington National Cemetery has certain rules around their the use. It is a sacred ground. I will say that I am all for the rules that they have laid. They are long established. Here is the thing. The rules say that you are not allowed to, for political use, take photographs, take videos, or play politics among the fallen soldiers, especially in Section 60, where the people from Iraq and Afghanistan are buried. You're not allowed to play politics here. You're not allowed to make campaign ads. You're not allowed to do these things. It is against the law. The, now, this rule has been broken multiple times. There are pictures. You can, you can Google them yourself. There are pictures of Biden and Obama walking in Arlington Cemetery, and you say, well, is every picture that taken of the president in the thing of breaking of the rules, whatever the case may be. It doesn't matter. Pe presidents have taken pictures there in the past. Allegedly, there was some sort of conflict between some Trump staffers or the private photographer who was hired, the private photographer who was hired by the family members, not by Donald Trump, not by his team. The, the family members wanted to commemorate the president coming to them and having a meeting with them. They hired their own photographer. There was some sort of controversy with someone who worked there. I have a picture in my head of what this looks like. I have nothing to base this on, but I'm imagining it is not some button-down person. It's probably some person who doesn't like Donald Trump. That would be my guess. If I was gonna, if I was guessing, if I was a gambling man, that would be my guess is someone who is not a big Donald Trump supporter. There was some sort of controversy because they said, you're not allowed to photograph here, and they said, get the hell out of the way, blah, 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 possibly a shove. We don't know. This is not, Donald Trump did nothing wrong here. He was invited by members of the families, the Gold Star families of people who died, they wanted the president to be there. They asked him to. And he showed up, and they wanted to take pictures. And I get it that even the Gold Star families are not allowed to bend the rules about Arlington. But what makes it a political statement is the fact that Donald Trump exists, and he was the president. He's currently running a campaign. It makes it political because of that. If you're invited there, I don't see the, I don't see the issue here. They wanted pictures. Give them what they want. I don't care. Donald Trump's campaign didn't post, as far as I'm aware, I'd have to actually double-check this. They, he wasn't out there just posting a bunch of pictures from Arlington National Cemetery. That, not that I saw. And I don't understand what the deal is. I don't understand the controversy, except that people always want to criticize Donald Trump for things that every politician does. By the way, Kamala Harris, she wasn't invited. Why do you think that is? Because she wanted to say, oh, how dare Donald Trump play politics with the deaths of these soldiers? Well, you know what? I recall you saying you were the last person in the room when Joe Biden made the decision to withdraw from Afghanistan. You know why you weren't there? They don't want you there because you're responsible for their deaths. You might not understand that because you don't see the world like that. But you made a terrible decision that put Americans and so many Afghans in harm's way and they are dead because of you and your incompetence. You and Joe Biden, your boss, your incompetence led to their deaths. The families want nothing to do with you. And you want to talk about Donald Trump's playing politics. Well, how about the fact that your boss wanted to be the guy who withdrew from Afghanistan? He didn't give a shit 
about how bad it was going or what was happening. He wanted to be the one who said, I ended the war in Afghanistan. Well, guess what? He got his wish. He ended the war in Afghanistan, and now you own it because he made mistakes. That is a t- He'll blame Donald Trump still. Donald Trump signed a deal. It said we had to leave. So I just was honoring the deal made by the former president. Well, actually, Donald Trump, the deal that he signed, the deal he signed said, we will leave Afghanistan if the Afghan government can maintain control over the country. And if the Taliban takes control of any part of the country, we are not going to leave. The second that the Taliban, you withdrew from the north and the Taliban advanced, you were under no obligation, no contractual obligation to leave the country. But you did. And you don't get to blame Donald Trump for that. That was on you, Joe Biden. That was on you, Kamala Harris. I was the last person in the room. She said, you own it. The 13 deaths are on you. All of those Afghans who are now dead, who worked with us, who are our allies, who were murdered by the Taliban, their deaths are on you. How about the 19 million girls who now have to wear a full burqa in public? They don't get to go to school. The marriage, uh, the age of consent in Afghanistan is like nine years old now. How about that? That's on you too. You don't get to just say, oh, well, we, we got out of Afghanistan and Donald Trump's playing politics with the death. The deaths are political. They were made by politicians. You did this. You made it political with your incompetence. And you don't get to just be mad at Donald Trump because the Gold Star families actually won him there because he didn't kill their children. You did. <laughs> so the whole thing's a non-troversy, as I like to call it, and it's, it's just it's silly. I don't know. I, it makes me upset, but at the same time, it's expected of the media that they're going to do these kind of things. It's just silly. All right. Anyway, we're going to leave it there for the week. I do have an announcement for those of you who are in the St. Louis area. Next Sunday, the 15th. Next Sunday, the 15th, there is a movie playing in St. Louis. It finally got some theaters to open up in in St. Louis called Am I Racist? It's Matt Walsh, his new film that is going to be out. Next Sunday on the 15th, I'm going to see this movie. Anyone who would like to join is welcome. You can send me a message. I will send you the details. And But we're going to try and get a bunch of people to go to this theater and show some support. It's not often that conservative movies wind up in the theater. So if you have a chance to go see Reagan starring Dennis Quaid, go do that. And if you would like to come see Am I Racist next Sunday, you find a way to hit me up. I will provide you details. And we can have a Crestman conversation movie watch party in a theater in St. Louis, so put that on the calendar. Anyway, we're going to leave it there for the week. As always, I hope you guys have a great week, and I will catch you next Friday.